Uh, without any further ado, Kevin Shackleton, I'm bringing it over to you, my man. Round of applause. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a privilege to be in this room full of uh, practitioners of uh, implementing security in the uh, automatic uh, computing machines. So, uh, several years ago, I was at a talk at a conference where I saw Brett Victor talk about the future of programming. And his talk inspired me to think, what would the future of computer security look like? So what I'd like to do today is take a step back and look at all the research and the activities that have occurred in our nascent field of computer security. Because we do best when we take that step back, learn, it what's, learn what has been done before, reassess our current situation, and then adjust our course to prepare for the future. So with that, let's begin. So our industry starts uh, in 65 and 66 with the congressional hearings on computers and privacy. So if you recall, there was a lot of debate um, around all of the data that was being collected by various federal agencies, and that data was, of course, increasingly stored on you know, memory drums and other forms of, of media. And there was discussion about establishing a national data center or a data bank to house all this data. And so these congressional hearings were over the ethics of that and the privacy implications, as well as the technical feasibility of building such a system. Now the experts largely agreed that building a secure system, as was described, was not possible in that time because we didn't have the knowledge or expertise to make that secure. That brings us then to three years later, where for the very first time at the AFIPS uh, Computer Conference in 1967, Willis Ware led a track on talks focused on computers and privacy. And Ware actually delivered the introductory talk at the conference in which he laid out the current state of what he described as two problems, the problems of security and the problems of privacy. So with where security was the problem of how to secure uh, federal and military systems, and privacy was how do you secure pretty much everything else. And so Ware's talk was really more of a call to action, that the world is increasingly becoming digitized, that we must assume that attackers will start to attack these new systems that we build, and that we were woefully unprepared to deal with those particular threats. Now, Ware was a bit optimistic that we could solve the security problem, the security in federal and military systems, because he thought that our existing controls and practices and standards in that space would serve us well as we went to secure our computer systems. And he was much more concerned about the privacy problem or security of everything else or security of the private sector because he didn't see any analogs um, as to the, the federal or military side. And additionally, he noted that, uh, you know, there was no system that had been developed with security in mind. Now, three years later, Ware authors the Ware Report, which, uh, from the RAND Corporation, uh, we call it the Ware Report, but technically it's called Security Controls for Computer Systems, and it lays out security controls that should exist for a secure computer system for use in a federal or military space. Now, while it's specific to the federal and military space, all these same concepts apply to the private sector as well, too. And in the Ware Report, one of the key tenets that he calls out is that security is cheap when it's incorporated into your system as early as possible. So simply put, when you're designing a system, if you account for security from the start, that's gonna be far cheaper than it is to try to retrofit it after the fact. Now, Ware also noted um, the notion of these new things, these networks that were popping up at the time, and we'll talk more about networks in a little bit, but Ware did note that in the, in the environment where you have a computer network, where two computers are talking to each other, it's vitally important that the communication between those two computers is secured. Um, and then the report ends on a, on a kind of a somber note, noting again that uh, despite being three years after the, his first talk in 67, that the industry was in no better state, that we were still unprepared for what lies ahead. Now two years later, the Air Force 
produces its own report um, on secure systems. We call this the Anderson Report. Uh, this report uh, covers security for Air Force's particular systems. And what's notable about this report is it focuses a great deal of time on the design of a secure operating system. And so the, the Anderson Report incorporates very cutting edge research uh, that has just been uh, talked about a few years ago around things called uh, security kernels. So that's this thing that's like a core part of the computer that handles all the security functions. Um, this interesting technology called reference monitors that monitor all file and memory access in the system to ensure that uh, that access only goes to, to users or, or processes that are authorized to view that data. Uh, interesting architectures like a ring-based uh, security architecture um, or processes that operate at different levels of privilege so that you can adhere to the concept of least privilege. So all of those things were called out in the Anderson Report. Additionally, the Air Force was, do is, was doing something very interesting at the time. Uh, they called them Tiger Teams. So these were skilled individuals in a small team environment that would deliberately go and try and attack Air Force's systems. Now, uh, the Anderson Report noted that all of the Tiger Team's activities within the Air Force, uh, unfortunately, have always been successful. Have always been successful. So they've always been able to find vulnerabilities and weaknesses in those systems. And like the Ware Report, the Anderson Report also called out the emergence of computer networks and the risk that in a network environment, just compromising one node or host in that network puts the entire network at risk. And finally, the final paper I'm going to talk about is the protection of information in computer systems. This is the 1975 paper from Saltzer and Schroeder, where it talks about many core tenets or principles of computer security. Now, four years later, uh, these principles are still very relevant, as we all know, and I imagine 40 years from now and even beyond will also be relevant. Now, one of the principles that I think is worth noting, because it will come up later, is this notion of work factor. And in their paper, they describe work factor as the effort it would take, or the work it would take for an attacker to compromise a particular system or get access to the data that they desire. And so it's an important that the work factor required to obtain or attack a system is always higher than the value of getting access to that system. Because at that point, it's not worth it for an attacker to attempt to get access to that data because they're expend too much effort. Now, you may be thinking that this sounds like a lot of academic research, a lot of papers and reports. Uh, you know, what does it look like in practice? And that's where it, where it brings us to Multics. So Multics is, of course, the operating system in use by uh, many uh, agencies within the federal government, as long as um, critical businesses. And Multics is the pinnacle, I would argue, of the current state of computer security right now. So Multics was designed from the ground up with security in mind. All of the principles and more that I didn't even discuss were incorporated into the Multics operating room. Yet, Multics still has vulnerabilities and weaknesses. Recently, some programmers at Multics uh, released a retrospective of sorts on various security bugs that were discovered within Multics and subsequently fixed. And they released this so that we can learn from the mistakes that occurred in Multics. So, two interesting bugs that I thought were good to reflect upon was uh, a bug where a malicious user could pass an argument into the operating system. And this, the value of that argument would overflow the bounds that were expected. And that would cause the system to crash. Another bug that they discovered and fixed was that a malicious program could pass an invalid memory address, one that wasn't expected by the system. And if you were careful, you could pass a memory address to a protected part of memory and your lesser privileged program would execute that code or those functions in the higher privileged memory. Now, the good thing is, is that these bugs have been fixed in Multics. The other great thing is that we know about these bugs and we've published a retrospective on them and we've all talked about it and understood 
these classification of, say, overflow bugs or, or these indirect memory address bugs. And so now I would imagine, if you think 40 years in the future, that we'll have accounted for these types of errors into our programming languages, into our future operating systems, into our other systems, and we won't run into these particular errors. Instead, we'll just encounter new ones that we don't know about today. Now, let's switch gears a bit and talk about a very uh, relevant topic, which is that of cryptography. So, uh, for as long as we've been communicating as people, there have always been people who want to keep their communication uh, secret. And conversely, there are others who want to break that, that secrecy to learn what those individuals are discussing. And so, the NSA uh, is the arbiter of all cryptography research here in the United States. All research on cryptography flows through the NSA. All of the best researchers in cryptography um, exist in the NSA, because if you're doing cryptography research, that is the place to be. And the NSA has this interesting dual concern with cryptography, and that is that the NSA is tasked with building very secure ciphers for use within the United States, within our military and federal system. Ciphers that we don't want people to break. But they also are in charge of breaking every single cipher that exists, including those that also may be in use here in the United States. And with the rise of and the emergence of networks, and we have computers and the further digitization of this world, where computers want to communicate with another one, we want to share data with a computer, we need to do so in a secure manner. And so cryptography has now become a vital part of our industry. Now the NSA though, like I said, controls access and influence on all of cryptography. And so, one of the recent things that the agency has done is uh, this paper that I'm sure some of you uh, saw floating around is a paper on the Hagelin cipher machine, the M209 model in particular, and it's a paper discussing how to break the cipher on that machine. The NSA, as it does with all cryptography research, reviewed it and talked with its researchers to suppress it, and it never was published. Now, some of you may be asking yourself, why would the NSA care about breaking the cipher on this obsolete cipher machine that none of us use anymore? No country uses this, no military uses this, this is an old machine, who cares? Well, the NSA realized that the attack vector that the researchers discovered that attacks this M209 machine also affects other modern ciphers that we use today. And of course, we can't let that information get out there lest our enemies know that their ciphers are weak and the NSA is able to break them. Now sometimes the NSA uh, needs some more direct means to influence ciphers and that's when they uh, put backdoors or trapdoors into the encryption hardware. So of course I'm referring to Project Thesaurus uh, which is where uh, the US government along with um, our friends in the West German intelligence made an offer to the Swiss crypto AG company um, back in the late 60s. And that offer was a secret one in which we bought out the company. And so now the CIA and the West German intelligence uh, secretly run crypto AG. And if you're not familiar, crypto AG is the maker, is the premier maker of every cipher machine used by governments, militaries, and businesses alike. So here we see the H460 uh, released in 1970, so just nine years ago. This was the first cipher machine from Crypto AG that was designed solely by the NSA. So the NSA did all the cipher design, handed it over to Crypto AG, and they produced it. Um, and of course, this cipher is meant to be broken by the NSA and only the NSA. Um, our agreement with Crypto AG is such that when a US customer uh, purchases a machine from Crypto AG, they get a version that is a secure cipher, and then everybody else uh, gets one that's, that's uh, insecure. So this has been um, a fantastic success for our intelligence community, and this is something that I see lasting for probably at least another 40 years or so before anyone figures this out. <laughs> now, cryptography is not just in the realm of hardware. Um, again, with the rise of computerization and the rise of networks, it's become ever increasingly important to have a 
uh, cryptographic algorithm or cipher that works in software. And so recognizing this need, the US government and the NSA proposed that we have a national standard that we can all align to so computer systems can all talk in the same secure manner. And so IBM stepped up to the challenge and modified their interestingly named Lucifer uh, cipher uh, to DES or DES. And the NSA actually jointly worked with uh, the IBM cryptographers on the DES cipher. Now the NSA's influence was in three main areas. So the first is that the NSA uh, reduced the symmetric key, which is the most important part of this cipher, uh, from 64 bits down to 56 bits. Now that might seem, not seem like too much, but that's several orders of magnitude reduction in work factor when it comes to uh, attacking this cipher in a brute force manner. Interestingly, the IBM researchers working on this cipher discovered an interesting attack vector that, was, that DES was weak to, which is something that we now know as differential cryptanalysis. Now, the NSA researchers were very surprised by this because they, of course, have known about this for years and have used it to attack other countries' ciphers. So the fact that IBM discovered it on their own was a bit concerning, but the NSA was able to get the IBM to agree for national security reasons to you know, uh, suppress all knowledge and research on this particular topic. And then related to that, um, the DES cipher has this feature called S-boxes, which is basically like the magic black box that does all of the work in the cipher. The NSA designed the S-box, or actually redesigned it for IBM. And they actually made it more secure by making the S-boxes, the NSA implementation, um, resilient or more resilient to those differential cryptanalysis attacks. And that was done so that when other researchers were examining DES, they wouldn't find that same attack vector because we want to keep that information as secret as possible for as long as possible to help out the NSA. Now, oh, I also forgot to mention that, you know, while this is all going on, um, there's some interesting developments just in the last couple of years. So, a couple of researchers um, going by the names of uh, Diffie and, and Hellman, they just uh, produced a paper on a very interesting and novel concept. Um, and this paper, the NSA tried to suppress this work, but uh, they, they proceeded. And in this paper, they describe a mechanism how two individuals who have never spoken before, never communicated, can somehow have a secure communication over an insecure channel. And they call this thing public key cryptography, which sounds like an oxymoron um, and flies in the face of everything we've known previously about cryptography. But in parallel, some other researchers at MIT have also released an algorithm on public key cryptography uh, just a short time later, and they call theirs uh, by their initials of the researchers, uh, AES, or RSA, that's what it is. So, um, the NSA, of course, uh, is interested in maintaining control over ciphers and algorithms, but it's, it's gonna be interesting to see where things go in the next 40 years um, as researchers are bucking the trend and not, uh, not towing their line to the, the NSA. So I mentioned that we would talk about networks, and so uh, pictured here is a computer scientist and privacy researcher Paul Armour on the left, and uh, Willis Ware, you know, the Ware Report on the right. And both of these individuals understood the importance of computer networks and their applications or implications on computer security. Remember Paul Armour here on the left, because we're gonna come back to him um, at the very end. So networks, of course, are nothing new. Um, in fact, you could say that uh, one of the, uh, the first um, data networks was when the French created their uh, network of semaphore towers across all of France. Uh, the French built uh, nearly 600 of these towers across the country in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And this network was used to communicate uh, exclusively by the military and government across their country. So communication that would take days by a messenger to travel could now be done in a matter of hours using these semaphore flags and towers and spotters. But it didn't take long for two French bankers to learn how to abuse the network. And so they simply bribed an operator of, a, of the Paris Tower and another operator of the Bordeaux Tower 
And they had the Paris operator uh, secretly signal, put a little character in the stream of each day's communications that would indicate whether the Paris stock market was up or down. And their co-conspirator in Bordeaux would pick up on this message and pass it along to the bankers, where they gained on this knowledge that they got in, say, three hours, they would take the rest of the market three days to learn, so they were able to profit from it. Now, we know abuse in networks today, so of course the AT&T telephone network um, is uh, by far the, the most prevalent network in the United States, and we've got these individuals called that are calling themselves phone freakers building these, these uh, boxes, these blue things, that produce tones and frequencies that allow them to make free calls in the network. So again here, when a network exists, you're gonna have bad actors doing things on it that they shouldn't be doing. So it's no surprise that when uh, there was a presidential directive in 65 to establish the COINS network, or the COINS network experiment, that is a uh, experiment to link up our intelligence agencies and share data between them. This is an example of a network uh, which reached four nodes um, that was built with security in mind from the start. Obviously, the data that they were sharing is very sensitive, and so it's security of the utmost importance. But conversely, a very popular network, or has become very popular, is the ARPA network. So this was conceived uh, around the same time as the COINS network, and its stated goal was to link up research institutions to share data. And the ARPA network has been a tremendous success. Uh, the technology that it's built upon um, is uh, clearly the superior to every other network we've built. And it, it's been operating for only 10 years now, but in the past 10 years, it's already grown to nearly 200 nodes, which is just astounding. But yet, security was not a design goal of the ARPA network. And we actually see that in this example program that was written only two years after the operation of ARPA network came online, where a researcher wrote a program called Creeper. And Creeper would copy itself to other nodes or hosts on the network. And if you logged into a node that was infected with Creeper, in your teletype terminal, you would get this message saying, I'm the creeper, catch me if you can. Now, another researcher then wrote their own program called Reaper, and Reaper would spread itself through the network, cleaning up all the copies of Creeper. Now, this is a very innocuous and kind of fun example here, but we can all imagine a malicious program or something far more nefarious that would spread throughout our networks and do something more than just print out a message, a silly message to the teletech terminal. But the good thing is, is that we know about this today. We've seen this now, we know about this threat, and we know that networks are not going away. Networks are, the ARPANET in the past 10 years has gone from just you know, a few nodes to 200 now. It's gonna keep increasing. So now we have the knowledge to protect ourselves from this as we further build out our networks. And finally, that brings us to today. Now, I had the pleasure of speaking recently with Ms. Nibaldi of MITRE Corporation, and she shared with me a draft of this document that she's gonna publish actually uh, next month uh, to this day. So October 25th, she's gonna publish this, and she's calling this the Proposed Technical Evaluation Criteria for Trusted Computer Systems. Now, I, I had a chance to skim through the document, and there's a lot of good information here, and it seems like that this is gonna be a pretty impactful document for our industry. So I think it's important that we, we grab people's attention with this. So I don't know, maybe we could you know, make the color like bright orange or something like that so it really sticks out, but I don't know, that's kind of silly. Um, so if we think you know, back that we've only been in this industry for 15 years, but we've learned so much in the last 15 years. We've learned core principles and concepts that are gonna take us for the next 40 plus years. We've had lessons learned. We've seen examples of attacks or thought about attacks that could occur. And so I'm optimistic that we'll take that knowledge and use it to improve things if we were to imagine ourselves 40 years from now. It would be a shame if we got out of that time machine and we took a look around and the situation that we're in doesn't look much different than it does today in 1979. 
Now, before I go, I want to leave you with something that Paul Armour, remember that he was a computer scientist and privacy researcher that I said to remember that knew about the growing importance of networks and their effect on computer security. And I want to read you something that he wrote just four years ago in 1975. There will be several microprocessors in every car. Trucks will probably have one at each end of every axle. There will be one in most appliances. There will be one pasted on the back of every typewriter. I'm sure there are countless uses that we don't even dream of today. Five or 10 years from now, most computers will probably be attached to a network or be reachable via a telephone number. And most will probably adhere to a standard protocol. But by then, we should have been wise enough to develop safeguards that will make unwanted penetration from the outside difficult and expensive. Note that I did not say impossible. Thank you.